It's early 1987, and a young greenhorn of a cadet journalist has just moved to Sydney from Queensland, a state in the final throes of its long and conservative tenure under the God-fearing hillbilly dictator, Joe Bielke-Peterson. The greenhorn has rented a narrow, cockroach-ridden townhouse, unbeknown to him, and until very recently, a former bordello in Fitzroy Street, Surrey Hills. And in those first few months in his new home, he remains puzzled and terrified throughout the night and into the early hours by strange, drunken men relentlessly banging their fists on the front door, demanding to be let in. But on this Saturday night, in the late summer of 1987, the Greenhorn ventures out and down towards South Dowling Street, where he intuits that nearby, some sort of gay and jolly street carnival is taking place. As the Greenhorn heads towards Oxford Street, he sees something so shocking, so jaw-dropping to a hayseed raised on Bielke Peterson's gobbledygook mantras like, you don't tell the frogs anything before you drain the swamp, that almost 50 years later, that moment still seems like an hallucination. What the Greenhorn sees is this. A young man in his mid-twenties, dressed in a Roman-style toga, roller skating furiously towards Oxford Street, affixed to the back of the toga, rising resplendently from the man's shoulders is a pair of white, feathery angel's wings. This was eye-popping enough for the Greenhorn, who, before his move south to the big bad smoke of Sydney, thought that having a gay time was nibbling on a biscuit-coated ice cream, and a golden one at that. Just as the apparition reached within metres of him as he waited at the traffic lights on that distant balmy evening, a corner of the angel's flapping toga somehow got caught under the wheels of his left skate. And with a whooshing sound, the toga, the wings, the whole edifice was suddenly ripped off as a magician might whisk away a tablecloth without disturbing the plates and cutlery on the top. In that instant, what remained was a naked, fleshy blur that continued to careen towards Oxford Street, the clattering skates not missing a beat, the wings abandoned and left in the wake of a bare male buttock that, if memory serves correctly, was dusted in glitter. We're not in Brisbane anymore, Toto, thought the young journalist. I was that greenhorn, and it was my first experience of Sydney's famous gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. It's hard to believe that that angelic apparition in 1987 was less than 10 years after the very first Sydney Gay Mardi Gras on June 24, 1978. A moment not of love and community and inclusiveness, but of hate and violence, with marches clashing with police and, metaphorically, hitting a wall of generations of community ignorance and intolerance. It was a scenario I was all too familiar with in Brisbane and the city's history of bloody street marches. There too, dreams and ideologies met the cold reality of police truncheons. Eggs were thrown and punches exchanged when after the demonstrators were repeatedly told that the magistrates saw no reason as to why they should not be admitted, police continued to refuse entry. Whilst demonstrators went through a repertoire of slogans, the court began remanding the 53 people arrested on Saturday night but before midday, another seven people were in jail. That night and the following day, some of those arrested were locked up and brutalised in the dank cells of the Darlinghurst Police Station, near the triangular corner of Forbes and Burke Streets in Darlinghurst, just north of the Sydney CBD. 
Those warriors would become known in time as the 78ers. Gay rights organiser for that historic march, Alan Hyde, decried the violence against gay people at the time. Police from Darlinghurst Police Station very regularly attack gay people in our gay community up in Oxford Street and William Street. It's a very, very common occurrence. And what happened on Saturday night was more, more dramatic and it's got media coverage, but it happens all the time. In the grandest of ironies, this epic story has now come full circle. The sandstone monster that was the Darlinghurst Police Station is now home to Qtopia, the world's largest museum dedicated entirely to queer history and the LGBTQI community. The building, built at the turn of the 20th century, was a brutalist nightmare of poorly lit cells, including one of the padded variety for, as authorities described then, violent cases. Now, as the Qtopia Museum, a sort of miraculous exorcism has replaced that horrifying history with light and love. Sydney Lord Mayor Clover Moore said positioning the museum in the old police station would heal past injustices and celebrate the community's resilience. At 11 o'clock this morning, at Sydney's National Art School, Qtopia will be officially opened by Anthony Albanese, New South Wales Premier Chris Minns and Lord Mayor Moore, News Corp Chairman Lachlan Murdoch and his wife Sarah, whose foundation donated $1 million towards the realisation of the museum, will join about 400 other guests from the world of politics, the arts and sports, including former rugby league hardman and gay icon Ian Roberts. The museum will celebrate queer stories, the community's historical struggles, particularly during the dark years of the HIV-AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and 90s, its setbacks and triumphs, and its ongoing and extraordinary contribution to Australian life. The timing is perfect. On March 2, Oxford Street will be once again full of angel wings, glitter and the occasional bare buttock for the Mardi Gras parade. Roaring back onto its traditional parade ground, Sydney's gay and lesbian Mardi Gras revving up a bumper crowd, led as always by dykes on bikes. Followed soon after by Ita on a trike. Less than two years ago, ABC Chair Ita Buttress and former High Court Justice Michael Kirby advocated for the city's first queer memorial and museum to put down its roots in the former lockup near Taylor Square and Oxford Street, the Sydney gay community's spiritual home and stomping ground. After the City of Sydney Council approved start-up funding of almost $300,000 for the museum in mid-2022, Momentum and goodwill quickly followed. First the Murdochs, then the Minns government, which would ultimately contribute $3.85 million to the museum and ensure its unique address. Edwina McCann, editor-in-chief of Vogue Australia and publisher of news prestige titles, has been a powerful advocate for Qtopia. Just even having been a young fashion assistant on Vogue the first time I I worked for the brand a very long time ago now in the 1990s. I mean, the impact of the HIV AIDS epidemic was dramatic. And I know that was true of a lot of the creative arts industries. I lost friends. I lost colleagues. I was a very young girl confronted with some pretty traumatic losses, really, of extraordinary individuals. And you felt how much was lost. There was almost a little bit of a a creative vacuum locally after this horrific event. So you want to make sure that those people and the stories and their talent and, and just how much Sydney has been given by this community, like the richness of this city, it's one of the things I think that makes and has made Sydney such a special place in particular. And I, I feel you, you don't want that to be lost in an intergenerational conversation where the norm today is perhaps quite different 
it's not even just it, that it's a gift, I think, what's been delivered here for Sydney indeed, but for Australia as well and for the world, frankly. Mm. Mm. But it's also we should be th- thankful that we can record this history now and that it's not forgotten because that's when, unfortunately, history can repeat itself. Qtopia will become a fixture on the Sydney tourist itinerary for grown-ups and, importantly, groups of school kids. There's a very dark history there and for it to be now reborn in such a positive way is, you know, I think that's just remarkable. I think that they will come up with incredibly clever and creative ways of reaching young Australians in particular, but all Australians. Coming up, whatever happened to that roller skating angel? While I've got you, we'd love you to subscribe to The Australian for our unrivaled news, analysis and commentary. Check us out at theaustralian.com.au and we'll be back after this break. Qtopia's dedicated head historian, Gary Wotherspoon, the award-winning author of groundbreaking books including Gay Sydney, A History, says it's crucial to have a place where the stories of the queer community can be told and retold. We have been here as long as everyone else, but we have expressed ourselves differently or we have been recorded differently. So part of Qtopia's role is certainly what we might call setting the record straight and bringing forward a lot of these stories, many human interest stories, many stories about what you might call broader social change. Gary says the very existence of the museum is still sometimes difficult to comprehend. Very sort of mind-boggling for someone of my age who remembers the early days of gay lib. Whoever thought of gay marriage, a queer, you know, same-sex marriage, it was just, it wasn't even on the agenda or it was sort of inconceivable then. But I think what you might call attitudes to homophobia these days, it's very like transphobia. And that's almost like the new frontier of what we might call intolerance of minorities in a, a very otherwise very good multicultural society. Edwina McCann says today's official opening and the reality of the museum itself has already proved emotional for members of the LGBTQI plus community. The museum will open its doors to the public tomorrow. I have already experienced individuals being incredibly emotional about the fact that it will even get done and emotional about the curation of what's in it just because so many people could never have imagined that this day would come. And I think that perhaps the location, particularly with the 78ers, takes them right back to where it all began for them, well, not necessarily where it began, but certainly to a pretty horrific punctuation in that beginning. And the fact that perhaps some of that trauma is relived, but also owned and able to be just moved, moved on, I hope will be wonderful for those people. Occasionally, I think back to the naked skater of South Dowling Street. I wonder where he might be, how his life turned out, and how he managed that night without his wings and toga. He would probably be in his late 50s or early 60s now. I like to think he's perhaps a mature gentleman these days, maybe walking his dog down Oxford Street each morning, taking a piccolo, from a nearby cafe, he fully clothed this time, sensibly dressed, but hopefully not too sensibly and with a twinkle in his eye. I like to think of him wandering into Qtopia, a museum there to celebrate his community, our community, and that he might take a lot of satisfaction out of that and pride and remember things past. And I like to imagine that as he steps out of the museum and into beautiful Sydney, he is thinking with a secret smile on his face. Once, I was an angel. Thanks for joining us on The Front. 
Our team is Leah Samoglu, Kristen Amiot, Tiffany Dimack, Josh Burton, Jasper Leake, Claire Harvey, and me, Matthew Condon. Check out our journalism and subscribe to make sure you're always first to know at theaustralian.com.au.